Right. I think the numbers are going to keep going up, but I'm going to make a start because we're three minutes past. So, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's really, really amazing to see so many people here from all different parts of the UK and other parts of the world as well. It's great to see so much interest. Um, so my name's Kat. I'm the Community Engagement Officer at Trees for Life. Um, and this is our first public webinar of 2021. There will be some more coming up, so keep an eye on our Facebook page or Eventbrite page um, for more details of what's coming up. My colleague who's with me tonight is Alan McDonnell, who is the Conservation Manager at Trees for Life, and he's going to be giving the talk tonight on beavers. So before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. So I think most of you have found the chat now. Um, hopefully you can also see the Q&A. Actually, I've just spotted there's a question in there. Um, if you do have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, if you could try and keep them to the Q&A box, that will make it easier for me to keep track of them rather than having to switch between the chat and the Q&A. Um, and then we can keep track of the ones that have been answered as well. We'll try and answer all, as many questions as we can, um, but we might leave some of them or possibly all of them until the end of the session, um, just so we don't interrupt Alan's flow as he's going. Um, so for anyone who's not quite sure, if if you hover over the Zoom screen that you're on, you should see a bar at the bottom with lots of different icons on it. And the chat box looks like a little speech bubble and the Q&A looks like two little speech bubbles. So if you click on them, the box should pop up for you to be able to type in. Um, and with the chat, you can choose to send your message to, to all panelists or panelists and attendees. Or if you want, you can even send messages to each other, but please be nice. Um, Thing, that's about it unless except to say if you've got any any issues if you know if you can't hear or something like that then please just send me a message if you can and I will do my best to sort it out while Alan is talking um okay so with that I think I will hand over to Alan to get started okay well thanks Kat and evening everybody uh, amazing to see see so many people here um as Kat said I'm the Trees for Life Conservation Manager and I've led on our uh, journey into beaver work over the past few years um, which picks up on what the charity's been involved with for you know since early in its, in its existence just over 30 years ago. Uh, obviously this is a very uh, current time for beavers um, so uh, that we're learning a lot as we go along and we want to share some of that show what we discovered along the way. So tonight I want to talk about um, a bit about how people have seen beavers over time uh, in different places. Uh, it's on the basis of uh, what beavers are, um, a bit of beaver history and plan to go through about a million years of beaver history in maybe five minutes. Uh, so we'll quick run through that. Um, what beavers do, um, and that's not all good news. Uh, so the kind of complex problem that has arisen from that and the questions I think we need to ask ourselves if we're going to find solutions to that, to that problem. Um, and finally, to conclude on a, on a hopeful note that there is hope of a way out of this uh, and that, that hope's very real. So I'm just going to turn my camera off, partly just to manage my own bandwidth um, and to help me manage between different screens here. So I'm looking at different things, so uh, I'll catch you all later. Um, but I want to start with a wee look at how uh, people have seen beavers over time and what beavers have been to us as people and how different cultures have seen them at different points in time. Uh, and I think it's really relevant because it has a real bearing on, on how we interact with the species and how we engage in, in, in the debate today. The different points of view, I think, come from different uh, perceptions of, of what the beaver is and, and almost what they mean. So this uh, totem on the left of the screen is a, a Haida people uh, totem of the beaver. Uh, and they very much saw the, people, the beaver as an ally. Um, the kind of the classic legend of this uh, North American Indian tribe was that uh, the beaver was the uh, the animal that gave the salmon back to the people after after the ravens stole it. The raven rolled up all the rivers in the country and tried to bear them away. And as uh, but it was so heavy that it kept having to rest on the trees. And it was the beaver that went and uh, and ate the trees down so that the, the raven had to drop salmon and, uh, and bits of the river across the countryside and that brought the salmon back to the people. So a real, um, that real perception there of the beavers being a, a key part of uh, the life that sustained them, the salmon was, were so important to those people. Then kind of shooting forward to medieval Europe and uh, the beaver as a, a kind of a, a symbol of virtue. Um, and this was 
hunters at the time and a legend kind of Chinese whispers got around that uh, beavers knowing they were being pursued by hunters for, for the castorium, the valuable, uh, uh, the, the castorium glands that have the uh, a substance in there that was very valuable for making perfume and drugs. The beaver would uh, rip its own base drives off as you see there uh, at the bottom and, uh, and surrender that to the hunter and that was that was used uh, as kind of an allegory of uh, man having to forego his sins in order to survive uh, and thrive. So uh, a bit of a wisdom for seen there. Uh, and then coming forward to 15th and 16th century, the, the beaver portrayed as, uh, in some cases, quite a quite a scary beast, quite a vicious thing. Those big teeth seen as a, seen as a threat. Um, on the left, there's a Dutch coat of arms from the from the 15th century, uh, a noble animal uh, with big, with strong tusks, so uh, a strong, almost like a, a fighting sign of defence. And then, but also at times, beaver's been very much seen as an asset, a resource uh, with um, real value, economic value. Uh, these are on the right there. That's a Canadian uh, fur trader. And uh, beavers were hunted for fur, hunted for meat, hunted for the castorium that I mentioned. Uh, and at times there was a, a major trade in that. And the, the over exploitation of, of beaver is very much features in their story that, that we'll come on to later. Uh, uh, and on the left there, you know, uh, a reconstruction of uh, some tools that were made with that's a, those are beaver teeth uh, that make the, uh, the blade of, the, of that draw knife. There and so beavers were, were hunted to use that for tools uh, in the atmosphere uh, in the by, by people. So uh, the beaver as a, an economic resource and an asset is, is a, a key part of its story and, and one of the key perceptions uh, of the beaver. And then we come to a time with a result of all of that uh, exploitation and use of beaver as a commodity. Um, Beavers came close to extinction, and uh, this is in North America, uh, where beavers really declined. And uh, this man is called Grey Owl, and he uh, appeared. He kind of became a silent movie star and became a bit of a an early twentieth century celebrity. Um, and he, this silent movie showed him with uh, some beavers that he and his wife raised. He was a, he, he was a half Scot, half Apache. Ojibwe Indian living in the Canadian wilderness in the back country, raising beavers and portraying this very romantic version of the beaver uh, and uh, a kind of almost using the beaver as a kind of a symbol of the, the wilderness and uh, a simpler relationship that we could have with, uh, with nature. And use very much using the beavers to kind of the window into that. Uh, one, of the, one of the lines from uh, his, uh, his first silent movie was, uh, uh, kind of a quote in between the stills that ruthless greed and slaughter have reduced this magnificent race, once numbering 10 million, to a mere remnant and awakened the sympathies of even his former enemies. And that, you know, the conservation message that was coming from that in the in the early 20th century uh, really started to resonate and was part of the, the National Parks movement uh, that came across the continent there and, uh, uh, and has influenced conservation worldwide, actually. Um, so that was a really uh, an interesting way of kind of the way the wilderness was presented, the beavers as part of that, um, this idea of reconnecting with nature and, and the relationship we could have there. Um, after his death, it turned out that uh, Grey Oil was not called Grey Oil, but he was um, born Archibald Stansfield Bellini, uh, and he was from Hastings in Sussex. Emigrated to Canada in 19 and, 19 and 6, and, um, but started traveling in the back country and ended up adopting uh, native culture, native Ojibwe culture and language, and sort of assimilated himself into that culture. So whether that uh, devalues his, his message and what he stood for or not, I don't know, but it, it speaks to some of the, the conflicting ways in which uh, beavers have been understood over the years. So, um, that kind of conservation consciousness um, led on to quite a spectacular episode in, in North American beaver history, which is um, parachuting beavers. And um, from the kind of the 1920s, the start in Idaho, the, uh, the park authorities in, uh, in the US began literally began parachuting beavers into the backcountry. 
And uh, this poster on the left here, I think, is um, really it, it really caught my attention because it so much speaks to uh, some of the the ingredients of uh, of what we have in Scotland today. So we have beavers being translocated um, from farm areas where they can damage crops and levees uh, in supposedly welfare friendly traps. I'm not sure there's much uh, animal welfare in uh, parachuting a beaver into, into the back country. Uh, and then in the bottom there, that poster, beaver dams in the mountains save water for fish, wildlife and agriculture. And um, it's interesting how these, these elements are, are still part of, of our debating today. Uh, and that's that, that picture up on the top right is uh, beavers actually being dropped out of planes and there is one after it landed. So somebody must have parachuted out of the plane with the beavers to catch them safely landed uh, and escaping off into the country. Uh, so quite an amazing and radical approach to translocation, which went on for about 30 years. They were still doing this in the, in the 1950s in America. Um, but that was a period when um, uh, at the start of the 20th century, people estimate that the, the beaver population in North America dropped to about 100,000 animals just from what was once 60 million and possibly much more than 60 million. So there's a, there was a focused conservation effort and some of that, so that conservation effort began as let's preserve beavers as a commodity and let's have that sustainable. But as you see, by, by the time we get to um, the kind of the middle of the 20th century, then uh, in California anyway, they were seeing the, the ecological role and the wildlife value of, of beavers for habitats. So that was part of their motivation there. Uh, and today in North America, beaver populations are estimated at between 10 and 15 million. So there's been a, a real recovery there uh, and those populations are continuing to grow. So what is a beaver? Uh, uh, the real basics are the beaver is uh, the third largest rodent species in the world after the capybara, and uh, so the Eurasian beaver is the third largest. Uh, North American beaver is slightly bigger. Um, it's about the size of a fat spaniel, uh, 25 kilograms, 30 kilograms, maybe a little less, just depends. Uh, they're purely herbivorous. Um, apparently, C.S. Lewis is one of those that uh, we have to blame for um, some people perceiving that uh, beavers eat fish. Uh, because in the line in which in the wardrobe, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver uh, served fish uh, to the children when they came in. Um, but they, they'll they eat mostly aquatic plants in the summer and woody vegetation in the winter. So uh, they eat on leaves, shoots, all different parts of the plant. They'll eat roots, bark, and under the bark of willow trees, they love willow and aspen trees and, and the thinner shoots. That's where they get their nutrition from. Um, they, are, they live in strong family units. Uh, so there'll be two generations of young uh, with a, a, a mating pair who tend to mate for life. Uh, they're, very, they're most active at dawn and dusk. Um, and they'll live for about seven to eight years. And you see some of the body parts up close. The tail is a, is a well, key distinguishing feature of the beaver. But also something they make a lot of use of so these, as, a, as a brace when they're, when they're chomping on big trees. Uh, they use a communication tool to, to ward off predators. Uh, and it's, a, it's an energy storage unit so they can keep fat in there, they can draw down on uh, in, in cold weather so they can increase their fat supply by up, up to 60% at, at, at times like this, but what we have in Scotland where it's, well, I'm in the center of Inverness here and uh, it's about minus five, minus six. Um, obviously in, uh, in North America, they're, they're, the species there is uh, experiencing much colder temperatures. Red feet, and you see this little grooming paw as well. They use, they've obviously got to keep their fur in good condition all the time. Uh, and perhaps their most uh, important feature is the uh, are their teeth. Uh, you see there, they are a kind of an orangey color, and that's from the amount of iron they have in them, so that, which keeps them hard uh, and makes them so fit for, uh, for cutting through timber and wood. And uh, those teeth uh, keep growing, so they need to wear them away. They need to be active all the time. And that's why, while they might not be feeding on uh, bigger trees, they will they will go at big trees and uh, and use them as partly uh, to help keep the, help keep those teeth from growing uh, into the jaw above or the jaw below. Uh, and then a beaver year is uh, fairly cyclical. Um, a lot happens in the spring. Females are uh, getting towards the end of pregnancy. 
uh, they'll be tired, fat reserves are low, and food can be if uh, food can be in short supply if it's if it's a late spring. Uh, and this is the time of year where there's a lot going on because uh, the two-year-olds, so uh, kits from two years previously, are becoming become sub-adults, and, and they start to leave the lodge and they start dispersing, looking for their own territories. Uh, and so there's a lot of activity as they're exploring around, trying to find territory. Beavers are fiercely territorial. So family units will uh, work together to, to fight off uh, beavers that come into their territory. Uh, and so, uh, and that actually makes uh, beavers one of the biggest causes of, of death to other beavers uh, and drives a lot of the kind of population dynamics that happen in, in range expansion because young beavers will, will keep looking on until they can find a territory that they can, uh, they can defend and set up in. Kids are born in April and May, two to four kids a year. Um, and the summer, uh, they, they, they gradually become more independent, a bit more able to, uh, to look around themselves, to forage, but they, they remain dependent really through well into their second year uh, and their second summer. Um, the autumn is all about getting ready for winter, really. They're busy at a range of uh, activities there, keeping their, keeping their lodges ready, caching food. And uh, they don't hibernate in the winter, but uh, they will be, how active they are will depend on, on how cold it is, uh, whether they can access any food or whether they need to go out and get to food caches that they left behind when it's really bad. Um, and, and then they mate through December and February. Uh, so that's when, when that happens. And then, so it's quite a quick uh, period from, from mating through to kits being born. Uh, I should just say on territories that uh, they tend to be how big they are will depend on uh, how good the habitat is, so what's the food availability, what the materials are there, um, and, uh, uh, and so the, the more of that there is, then habitats, territories will tend to be a bit denser, but they'll generally tend to be between one and seven kilometres of, of riverbank, um, so it just depends kind of what's going on and what's available. A question here, if I could just interrupt you for a second, Alan. Sure. Um, the question that's probably good to ask now. Karen has asked, how big is a family unit of beavers? Well, you'll have two generations. You have the, um, the the kind of the adult pair, and they could well, you could have up to up to eight young with them if you've had um, four kits in one year, and uh, there were four kits the previous year. Then uh, you could have you could have ten of them uh, in a lodge. Um, that would depend, that would reflect a uh, really good food availability in the territory, so a really rich territorial area um, and, and lots of opportunities because that, that food availability is, would make them, make them more fecund, more fertile. Thanks, Alan. Okay, uh, so I said I would uh, try and do a million years in five minutes. I'll see to that. I should, um, these slides here are uh, mostly the works on the collation work of Duncan Halley, who's uh, an inspirational Scottish Norwegian uh, who's uh, worked on beavers for decades and has, a, uh, has, has researched all this uh, in great detail. But this map here, Duncan uh, put together, and it shows the distribution of fossil evidence uh, across Europe uh, of the Eurasian beaver uh, since the Ice Age. Uh, the thing that annoys me most about this map is there's no sign of any fossil evidence in Ireland, uh, at least not yet. Uh, although there is good reason to think that they could have got there. Um, other, uh, there are other land mammals that have made it across, um, but we can't find any proof of that yet. So um, unfortunately for, uh, for us Irish, uh, we're, we remain beaverless. So that is where things were um, after the Ice Age. And um, this is where it got to just for the start of the 20th century, uh, just absolute close to extinction. They, there are estimates uh, that between these, these remnant uh, colonies of beavers, that represents about 1,200 animals just, uh, which is pretty staggering. And that is uh, a result of uh, hunting uh, for castorium, which was... Um, the, uh, I mentioned earlier the kind of the, the product of the scent glands uh, uh, in, in the beaver uh, and their meat and their fur. So huge trade in that, massive over exploitation, uh, very similar story in North America. 
and uh, this is all that was left. And but today the picture is looking a bit happier. So this is 2020 with um, a fair bit of Russia added in there. The black blobs are um, are, are the remains of where those four areas were. One, two, three, four. Um, plus some in Russia there. So all the uh, and, and the rest of the red are populations that have been reintroduced uh, through the 20th century um, since the 1920s really is when that began. But those black blobs represent the sum total of the original genetic material that today's Eurasian beaver population is, is taken from. So there is a genetic issue about, well, about the Eurasian beaver and a, a need for conservation to have an eye on diversifying that to make it a, a more robust species from a genetic point of view. The other interesting thing there is there's a green blob of Castor canadensis, the North American beaver, which the Finns reintroduced in the 30s. Uh, and they basically they introduced the wrong species of beaver. Um, so that one is knocking about up there in Scandinavia. And uh, it still remains to be seen what happens to that. It's assumed that they can interbreed. But Basically, from there are 27 countries that have uh, reintroduced beaver. Actually, the UK is, uh, is, is fairly late to this party. Um, and the, the drivers for that have, have varied over time. So in the 20s, uh, they went into Czechoslovakia. And the, the thinking there was this would be a resource, a commodity that uh, could be hunted again. We could have, they would have an economic asset, fur and custodium uh, they had in mind then. And then in about the 50s, it became a bit more wildlife minded and uh, the Czechs are part of that as well. But places like Germany, France and Holland uh, brought beavers back to have them as, as part of their, their native fauna again, purely to reintroduce them. Uh, and that, that was still a motivation used right up into the 80s. And then in the 90s and, and right through to the, the early 2000s, um, uh, Scotland was part of this looking at partly motivating to probably thinking about bringing beavers back for the ecosystem services that they provide. So for that ecological function back together uh, as well as wildlife restoration. And that's become a little more focused in some uh, relocate translocations that have happened since then. So uh, Mongolia, for instance, going way out east, uh, they brought Eurasian beaver back uh, to help restore groundwater levels uh, and clean up surplus fertilizer from arable areas. Um, and some of the English translocations have been actually not so much about ecosystem services, but really thinking about there's a strong focus on uh, people wanting to have them in the landscape and that, uh, that sort of uh, that, that tourism value and that visitor value and the existence value of, of having them back in. So there's, it's changing all the time, our relationship with beavers, what we, what we value them for uh, and how we want them. And I think that, uh, continues to work alongside completely different feelings about beavers where um, from people who see them as, as a pest, uh, as vermin or a, or a cause of, of, of huge problems to them. So these, uh, these different perceptions uh, and hope and ways the beaver uh, is seen uh, exist at the same time uh, in society and, and the, the issues that we have today in Scotland and the UK have been seen before elsewhere. Um, and uh, and I've worked and I've played out in different ways uh, over over this over this time period and perhaps particularly in the twentieth century. I've so, got a couple more questions, Alan. Just sure. while we're on this map, so someone has asked: Is the potential that the American beaver will outcompete the Eurasian beaver? Um, I wouldn't have thought so. I think they're more likely to interbreed, uh, and what how you come to that uh, kind of what's is that a good conservation outcome or a bad conservation outcome that's uh that'll be a matter of some debate I, I don't think i don't think they would compete as they've got very similar requirements the size difference is low um and if they're interbreeding they're probably more likely to collaborate uh or um if it's territorial competition then you know the, I wouldn't think the Canadian beaver has such a, uh, a kind of a combat advantage that, that it would consistently win. So I wouldn't think that would happen. 
um, but there might be issues about interbreeding, which um, people are actually in, in different minds about. Some people think that's that would be a loss of uh, genetic purity and species purity, and others think the species are so close that um, perhaps it doesn't matter. Uh, but that's a that's a long discussion. That does lead quite nicely on to the, the second question on this, which was, um, are you aware of any control on the population of the North, uh, North American beaver in Finland? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm afraid not, no. I think given by the size of that blob and the outliers there, uh, that uh, if there is any control going on, it is uh, less than effective. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I want to talk about what beavers do and, uh, and the, the effect they have on landscape. There are a few species that change landscapes in the way that beavers do. Uh, so I think that it's worth spending a little bit of time on that. This is an area in England where beavers have um, been reintroduced and in just in quite a small area, they're contained. And you can see how they have, you can see where the kind of the landscape around, so flat has started to change and become wetter. And let me just see if I can animate my slide. I can't. Okay. <laughs> so um, what you have there is signs of uh, the water flow being slowed down and water spilling out and creating wetlands. So these areas where we have, oh, there's one, um, where we have, uh, you can see the kind of the brown areas in the center there, drainage ditches kind of being overwhelmed. It's not flooding coming in. Um, this is where it is. sediment being trapped. So that's kind of slowing down, holding sediment and silt on, on the site, this wetland developing. At the top, uh, top of the photograph in the center, you see the um, what was quite a straight drainage channel starting to develop meanders as uh, beaver dams start to change the way water flows and move it around much more. So water's finding its own way uh, through the site. Uh, ponds develop and they develop their own vegetation Wetland plants come with that, um, and you get kind of these marginal plants that are half in the water and half out, so different, uh, wider conditions for different plant species coming through. Uh, you get uh, different tree species, more tree species arriving, and the structure of that changes. The beavers are eating trees, felling trees, that some trees are regrowing, others stay down. Uh, a build with dead wood comes with that, and um, some of the ponds they create become kind of become cut off and they sort of form these, these sort of still water pools. Um, beaver ponds can be great places for, uh, for fish to hide from predators because they are they tend to be too deep uh, for a, a wading bird like a, like a heron to come and uh, catch a fish from but too shallow for a, a diving bird you know to uh, like an osprey or something to, to come out of the or a diver to come out of the um, either from the pond surface or, or from the air. Uh, and take fish. So uh, that there can be little shelter areas there. And the water table overall is raised and that then starts to raise irregularly as well. So you get different water tables and different vegetative response to that. And so you have these kind of areas of different levels of wetness and dryness, different levels of vegetation, and the landscape really starts to change. You can, this slide really catches how a, a, a flat, fairly homogeneous landscape can become, start to become much more diverse. Um, and, and that landscape will continue to develop. Oh, I think my slides working now. <laughs> my, uh, I think my laptop is um, protesting grimly at the what I'm putting it to. So what does all that do? Um, this is a fairly, a very typical uh, graph uh, taken from the University of Exeter did this research on a site in Devon where there's a, 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 an enclosed population of beavers. And one of the things that, that what I was just showing you there in terms of that landscape and how they change it is it affects water quantity in the landscape and how that's an influence on, on flooding, uh, on drought, 
uh, and on fire, three kind of key aspects and things we might be faced with more of as, as climate change uh, rolls out across the world or increases across the world. So the graph here at the top is basically showing the bang center of that graph is where there's a dam, there's a rain event, and the response uh, above the beaver dams where there's no uh, beaver being affected is a sudden spike in the level of water in the river system. And that's that sudden spike will have overwhelmed the banks and caused a flood. Uh, but below the beaver dam, the water that's coming down the stream uh, is held back by the beaver dam and, and then released much more slowly. And so it never builds up to a never builds up to a spike and is much less likely to overflow the banks. And therefore you get this flood inhibition effect uh, from having beavers in the landscapes. They slow the way water leaves the land. Uh, and that also applies um, in, in times of dryness because that, um, that water's held on the, on the land for longer. And um, there was an article came out last week from Nature Scott about how we can expect drought to be more and more of a feature of even the Scottish landscape. You know, I think of Scotland as a, as a rainy country. Um, but there are times when, uh, times of year, when uh, actually drought is, is a real uh, influence uh, on habitats and our vegetation. Uh, and that has a range of uh, implications uh, for other land uses as well. So uh, anything that is holding water on the ground on our, on our land for longer and letting it go slowly can help even that out and help us ride out and mitigate some, some of these impacts of climate change. Uh, uh, in other parts of the world where fire is more of an issue, uh, beavers will also help to mitigate that because, uh, again, they're keeping water on the landscape and water doesn't burn. Uh, there's another classic slide, bit of research again from Exeter University in Devon on how beaver activity, beaver dams in particular, affect water quality. So uh, the, the, the two bars here are showing how the amount of sediment able to float in the water um, is quite high. There's, uh, if there's erosion from the land, uh, if there's bare ground beside the river and there's a rain event that's washed in, there's a lot of sediment in the water and that might well carry attached to that sediment if it's clay material and uh, might carry uh, fertilizers for instance off the land so you have nutrient input and that starts to change water chemistry excuse me uh, uh, that affects water quality whether it's uh, whether we're using it or wildlife is being affected by that beaver activity beaver dams in particular are um will catch will filter that will filter water so a lot of a lot of sediment is trapped behind uh, a beaver dam. And uh, beaver dams are slowly leaky. So the sediment is trapped, the water filters through, and you, therefore you have much cleaner water. And uh, the photo on the left shows you a, a bottle of water from uh, above the beaver dam, where, which hasn't had the benefit of that filtration. And the, bottom of, and the bottle on the right is uh, one that has been filtered out. One of the direct effects of that is the benefits to fish um, this photo on the left uh, uh, is one of a, a reconstructed salmon red, um, so a spawning bed basically where, and you can see that the salmon fry that are there, as adult salmon uh, come up the river to spawn, they're looking for clean gravelly beds in which they can uh, they can lay eggs, and uh, and those beds need to stay sediment clean as clean as possible for for the eggs to hatch. Uh, and then later as they grow a bit longer, the par that you see on the right, they're looking for, again, for that kind of bed to have little uh, areas to shelter from, uh, shelter from flow, to rest in. And, uh, and again, so they're not, they don't get clogged up by sediment. So these are kind of, that sort of that filtration effect uh, the beaver dams can bring, can help and, and pay on to other, other parts of the, the ecosystem. So this is where, and this is probably the, the kind of the key keystone beavers are referred to as a, a keystone species. Uh, and they diversify and, uh, and enrich the landscape. Um, they bring, they add more structure uh, to a landscape, as we showed, uh, as we showed a few slides ago. Uh, that provides more sh opportunities for sheltering, uh, both on the riverbank and in the channel. Um, so whether that's what they introduced to the channel or, or what they're up to on, on the riverbanks. Uh, and all of that uh, kind of increases the productivity of vegetation, brings more nutrient input, 
that boosts the food supply right along the food chain. You have this kind of upward spiral of, of, biodivers of biodiversity. So I'm going to hope that uh, my laptop won't fall over when I do this, but I'll see how that goes. Um, so there's more plant life on the bank, in the water margins, aquatic plants in the stream, more diversity uh, of, of plant species and tree species. Uh, and you have more dead wood, and that boosts the amount of fungal activity going on uh, and multiplies the opportunities for insects, it, it, both in the water and, and on the banks. So you have uh, midges coming in, water boatmen, mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, damselflies, dragonfly, and uh, larva stages caterpillars, moths, beetles, all of that uh, is, is starting to increase uh, around, your, around your river. That creates more prey and more food ability for, uh, for frogs and toads and newts. They themselves uh, provide great food for fish like salmon, trout, sticklebacks, eels and lamprey. Uh, and they uh, provide uh, food, all this plant life and the insect life and, uh, and some of that fish life uh, provide uh, feeding opportunities for otter, uh, so Benton's bat, water voles. And on the banks themselves, you've got, you've got more prey, small mammals uh, responding to those, uh, what's happening in the vegetation and the insect life. So more, more, uh, more wood mice, more bank voles, that's prey for uh, weasels, pine martens, other species that uh, it starts to a lot kind of that richness is starting to push outwards from the riverbanks uh, and wider into the land. And uh, again, all that you've got more opportunities, more shelf, more nesting opportunities, more food available for for songbirds here, like uh, siskin tree pipit. Oops, this last one going to come through, uh, and they themselves are you, um, you see more bird species come through so. Heron, osprey, uh, if you're not fish, kingfisher, dippers, grey wagtails, divers, like little grebes, mergansers. It, it just starts to spiral so much and it just becomes a, a, a proper cascade of life uh, as this, this web connects. And so much of that can be traced back to, to what the beaver does to a, to a landscape. So though that's, uh, those are some of the, the great benefits that beavers can bring us, but uh, they are not all good news. And um, on farmland, it's, uh, uh, there can be real problems. And this is, of course, comes to, for Scotland, uh, I, I think the key aspect of, uh, of where uh, beavers give us a, an issue to solve and resolve. So beaver damming activity, um, can cause flooding, and uh, when they and the beavers will tend to dam in flatter landscapes. Uh, they'll tend to dam water courses that are less than six meters wide. There are very few dams built on water courses that have more than a one in six gradient. Um, and they they will build the dams to to give them access to to food uh, or a lodge, um, and, and they won't bother doing that if they don't have to. So they look to raise the water level. They don't like to be out of the water. They'd rather swim there. So if they can dam an area, dam a stream, flood a bit of land and swim off to, uh, to access some food, then uh, that might well be worth their while. And uh, on one of the aspects of that is that there is uh, a lot of prime agricultural land in Scotland that is flat, that has drainage ditches, which are less than six meters wide and less than one in six gradient. And therefore there's, uh, you can get damming activity. And this is, this is certainly the case in Tayside uh, where this photo on the left is from. Uh, and you can see there fields being flooded uh, and you can, uh, you can, farmers see crops damaged by that and they might lose, they might lose thousands of pounds in some years to that sort of effect uh, caused, by, caused by beavers. Um, they also, uh, a beaver would rather uh, dig a burrow uh, to, to, to lodge in uh, than build the classic one out of sticks. So if they have the right kind of bank material, uh, they will, uh, they'll dig that open and they'll, they can dig themselves a, a very cozy wee place. But in some cases, if you have a friable kind of sandy, vulnerable sediment that they're digging into, then that can be prone to, uh, to collapse. And uh, so livestock can, uh, can fall through 
into uh, into beaver lodges and burrows and uh, and get in trouble that way, get injured or lost, or and sometimes you can get huge blowouts. So uh, the river itself will come in, uh, work open an opening that a beaver has created and and uh, lead to a, hu a huge amount of erosion. And so tons of topsoil can be lost to that. Uh, and that is obviously a, a major issue for the farmers that are affected by that. So there are loads of positives um, that we talk about that the beavers bring and, and, and they bring real benefits to, to the public at large, but those costs can, it can affect a, a small number of people so that many are benefiting from costs borne by a few. Uh, and that is absolutely at the center of uh, the issue that we're faced with in Scotland today. There is so much about, for my mind anyway, there's so much about uh, the issues we face today that we need farmers for. Um, and whilst uh, we need to see changes uh, in land use, uh, we need those farmers to, to affect that. And so I think some of this is about uh, how we take them with us and how we respect uh, where they're coming from. And that is where this becomes not just a practical issue, but, but very much a human one. And I'll say a bit more about that later. Oops. Um, this also comes up, migratory fish, salmon and sea trout come up as a, uh, an issue that uh, relates to beavers. The populations uh, have been in decline for a long time due to a range of factors. Um, and so this, this is a concern uh, for fishermen who, you know, who say, well, this is a valuable activity. The last thing we need is, is one more problem uh, from these beavers that have come in. So beavers and migratory fish have coexisted for millennia. And so uh, fish species uh, have therefore you know, evolved being able to travel over the top of, around, uh, or, th or swim through beaver dams. But they are a potential obstacle when water is low. So sometimes that can hold fish up uh, and prevent them getting to their spawning grounds. And so that there is a concern there. However, we also know that uh, beavers' presence means that uh, the water table is higher. There's a bigger base flow uh, and there's more water in the river during a drought. So beavers being present should mean that those times of low flow are less frequent. Um, and we've got the benefits I was just talking about of cleaner water, more refuge sites for, for young fish, more food available, lower mortality to drought and flood, uh, and more habitat for, uh, for fish to use. Um, and, and there are ways in which we can, where we know that there are issues where we can uh, to manage beaver dams to reduce them and let fish through. So there's a conversation here about what are the costs and benefits of this? the balance and uh, as you can probably tell from the way I talk and I think there is it's quite heavily slanted toward beavers being beneficial to fish uh, but again others will dispute that and see it differently and that uh, conversation needs to continue to be to be had and needs to be evidence-based and to look at that carefully and there's so much affecting fish populations that that is uh, I think that will remain an ongoing complex issue. Beavers eat trees. Uh, as mentioned earlier, they'll they'll have uh, they eat big trees. This is Simba, one of the uh, one of the trees for life dogs. Um, just giving a bit of scale uh, to these willows that uh, were being chewed by beavers and kind of just left randomly left, kind of precariously gnawed through uh, on the River Bewley. Uh, the classic answer to this is where you where you have trees that you value of this kind of size. You know beavers are around. Is to protect them with tree guards, and uh, I appreciate people say, "Well, that comes with, uh, you know, doesn't look nice, but um, it does at least allow the, the tree to uh, to persist." Sometimes people ask, "Well, why is trees for life in favour of a, a, a mammal that uh, that eats trees?" Um, and that's because we support the way they allow trees to evolve in a dynamic way and allow the natural process and the ecosystem to work. So. Uh, it, by working on riverbanks in the way that beavers do, they will break up areas of, uh, of tree cover. They uh, therefore allow different levels of shade and, and dappled shade to affect the water course, but also create different conditions for plants on the riverbank. And so where trees are regenerating uh, with beavers around, then that creates diversity there. And that diversity and that natural evolution uh, of a riverbank and river woodlands, uh, we really value. 
uh, and we think uh, will allow uh, more trees, more woodland cover uh, to develop. Uh, it's worth remembering as well that uh, all the tree species we have in Scotland today have also co-evolved and, and coexisted with beavers for millennia. Uh, so we are pretty confident that uh, beavers and trees uh, can, can live together quite happily. There are answers to, uh, to the issues that beavers raise, uh, and this is uh, one of the, perhaps one of the cleverest ones that's been developed, uh, the flow device mixed with a, a, a beaver deceiver. So this, uh, the, the diagram on the left shows the beaver down a cross section and how the pipe a lot basically prevents the water behind the dam, which is on the right from, uh, from flooding. So this can help to uh, re reduce flooding to neighboring ground neighboring farmland. It's basically just channeling water from behind the dam out downstream, safely downstream. The key aspect to it is the cage uh, around the inlet of the pipe, because the beaver, if A doesn't find that and can't dam it. So if, if a beaver spots a leak in a dam, it'll, be, it'll very quickly go to repair it. Uh, however, where uh, you have a device like this in place, uh, it, it's unable to do that. And so that's why some people call them beaver deceivers. Uh, another tool that is used is translocation. So this basically involves where a beaver is causing a problem. Uh, it is live trapped uh, in a trap like the one on the left, uh, baited with carrots and apples, which they're often quite attracted to, taken to a, a release site, uh, which is suitable for beavers and where there is uh, management in place to deal with uh, how they'll affect the changes that they'll bring. And, uh, and a new population is established or beavers are, are moved somewhere else where they're not going to have the same uh, impact on sensitive land uses. Uh, the photo on the right there, the person on the right is uh, Rasheen Campbell Palmer, uh, who's a, a beaver conservation hero. And there, there are a lot of beavers alive today that, that I've heard to thank uh, for that, for um, translocating beavers from Scotland. This is to um, a project in Yorkshire. Uh, but a lot of uh, Scottish beavers that are causing difficulties on Tayside are, are, are going to England and uh, starting new <clears throat> populations there. It's worth emphasizing that translocation isn't always possible uh, and isn't always advisable because it can create welfare issues, serious welfare issues that um, are, are effectively deal breakers. So if you, uh, if you can't catch an entire family group, you split a family group up, you may well be condemning uh, young beavers to a kind of slow, uh, a slow death. Uh, so that is a, that kind of impact on, on that individual animal, that individual beaver family um, would be a deal break. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't proceed in, in those circumstances. Uh, you need extensive planning the release catchment, not least for the, the kind of the level and depth of conversations you need to have with uh, the people around who might be affected by that and to, uh, and to plan how that will be managed in advance. Uh, rather than just taking beavers to a place because they think, oh, this looks good for beavers, and then um, we're going to see what happens in the rest of that catchment and responding then just create the same sort of problems that we have here on the Tay side. So it takes time, it takes real dedication, uh, but has been successfully carried out time and time again right across Europe. Uh, and, uh, and certainly we think it could be a, a key tool uh, in the beaver situation in Scotland today, uh, especially if it can be done strategically. Uh, and then the final uh, main tool for, for managing beavers is to really look at um, where uh, and how beavers interact with the landscape. So we can remove beavers from, from problem areas, uh, whether by translocation or by lethal control, which of course is done in Scotland. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not a permanent solution because those areas will continue to have beavers uh, come in, colonize that area. So it'll be, a, it'll be an ongoing problem. 95 to 98% of the problems with beavers happen within 20 meters of fresh water. And so if we can find a way to allow that, those first few meters of riverbank uh, to be uh, given up to natural habitat, so the land use isn't a conflict there, then that's how we can alleviate a huge amount of, of beaver conflict. So like the slide on the right here is a slide from Bavaria that shows where uh, you once had productive land that came right up to the margin of, of the river. 
uh, and a, a buffer strip has been given up um, from farming to allow that for other use, the natural use there. That has a, a range of other benefits for wildlife, um, including the kind of that, that buffer strip itself will reduce flooding and improve water quality and uh, uh, allow another uh, lot, of, lot of scope for habitats and wildlife. That needs a real kind of change in terms of how we view and balance our priorities. Um, but that is part of the, uh, I think a key part of, of the solution here. And a lot of the inspiration for that comes from where it's been, where it's actually been enacted and that's in Bavaria. So uh, Bavaria is, uh, is a flat area, has flat arable land, it's densely populated in the lowlands and it's got some really prime intensively farmed agricultural land, some of the best uh, farmland in, in Germany. Beavers were reduced, uh, reintroduced in the, I should say the 1960s and uh, conflict got intense there, um, particularly during the 80s as the, the beaver population grew to, to a size where its, its impact started to be felt and there was a direct clash uh, with that arable farming land use. <clears throat> uh, gradually, over, because of that conflict, by 96, they had a management system in place and they've actually got past that. Problems kind of melted away to, to really quite low levels in the, by the early 2000s. Uh, there's now a population of about 22,000 beavers in Bavaria. They occupy just about all the habitat that's available there. And they have a, a well-planned and resource management system in place there. And that's really the, the key to this. So with that, they have, they have a swift, swiftly responsive uh, and practical beaver management service where people can go out and assess the situation uh, and decide what kind of uh, mitigation is required. Uh, that uh, includes did include translocation, but basically there's nowhere in Bavaria left to uh, move beavers to, and occasionally they move them abroad, but generally that's not an option. Um, the key that they find to reducing their conflict is, is in this riparian approach, so giving up uh, the riverbank where it's possible. The, the Bavarian state has bought uh, farmland along rivers and, and turn that into strips. Other places have been done with agricultural support. Um, and a key part of uh, what they do as well, so a lot of where they still have problems now, there are about a thousand beavers a year killed in Bavaria. And that's done without any controversy, without any fuss, it's just a matter of fact. Uh, part of managing the impact of that species and finding the balance for them. And as a result, there's much less call for that sort of management. Farmers are implementing it themselves. Uh, it's more widely understood. The benefits of the beaver are widely understood, particularly in flood prone areas, um, but also for wildlife. And beavers are uh, largely a welcome presence in, in Bavaria now. So we have, uh, could we do that here in Scotland? Maybe we could. Um, it's a complex problem and by that I mean that everyone's right. Everyone brings different perceptions and values to the changes that beavers are bringing and, uh, and emotions are involved in, at times. There are these practical and human dimensions that we both have to deal with. Um, and we need, to, you know, we need to understand that today's landscapes are different uh, from when beavers were needed before beavers, uh, while well, beavers first lived in, in Scotland. There are signs of public support. This, uh, this wee pie chart is work that uh, Scottish Beaver, so Scottish Wildlife Trust and the Royal Zoological Society uh, were part of the Napdale official reintroduction to Argyle. And uh, this is the response they got in 2017, some nine years after um, beavers were reintroduced there. And people were asked the question, do you support beavers being in Napdale? And um, a large amount of support there. Nobody said no, uh, and that's that's really quite heartening. And, and there was clear sign of change for when for when their proposal was first made nine years before. We do have proven solutions to mitigate practical impacts. Uh, these require planning and investment if they're to work as they do in other countries. And I think we have to ask ourselves: Do we have the will to make this to make that investment? Um, we recognize that while the benefits are felt by many, the, the costs are borne by a few. Uh, if we can bring ourselves to make that investment, can we also resolve the human side of the issue? Um, beaver conservation and all its wider aims needs to do that 
if it's to succeed? Can we take everyone with us? Um, if we're to do that, we need to learn from elsewhere and we need to transition to coexisting with beavers in a fair and respectful way uh, and, and think about the scale of change that we're asking those who are directly affected, those farmers. That is uh, basically what I think it is, but also while I was researching this last week, I find um, that asking myself, what would Lassie do? Because I just, was just Googling stuff on the internet and find two, there's two episodes of Lassie uh, where she gets involved in, uh, in saving beavers. And the first one, she uh, is effectively involved in translocating beavers. Uh, the, there's a farm downstream of a beaver dam that Lassie finds uh, and her owner is uh, keen to look after the beavers, but uh, the farm downstream is saying, uh, I, need, I need more water, I need this dam to go. The dam went, the beavers rebuilt it. So um, Lassie's owner, he promised to, uh, to trap the beavers and, and take them somewhere else, give them to the National Park Service instead of them being shot. And uh, Lassie ended up uh, being party to uh, encouraging the beavers into the traps, fighting off a wolf in the process, although they're very complicated. Um, and then the second episode later, this picture on the right is of uh, Mrs. Lester, who is a, a, an irascible but lovable farmer who, again, lived downstream of a beaver dam and was complaining to the park authority about this beaver dam. And uh, there was a, a really interesting little exchange between her and Hank, who's the, um, the park ranger. And Hank says to Mrs. Lester, we find out that beavers can be very helpful in flood control and also create new trout habitat. It's worth the expense. Mrs. Lester said, I never heard of anything so ridiculous in my life. A nuisance is a nuisance. Now, I don't pretend that that completely represents how simple um, our, uh, our issues and our discussion about beavers is today, but it does capture a wee bit of the, um, uh, the different points of view and how we need to uh, respect both sides and to uh, arrive at a, a proper conclusion in terms of well, what kind of investment will we make and what are we prepared to uh, what are we prepared to go for that. Uh, uh, in the end of that one, Lassie ended up uh, translocating the dam, uh, which is a new technique. I'm not quite sure uh, how well founded that was, but uh, that made Mrs. Lester happy. And uh, maybe there's something to be drawn there in terms of, of how we go forward. Uh, and that is that is me. So I'm uh, yeah, really interested in uh, what people made of that and what, what questions people have. Thanks for that, Alan. That was brilliant. Fascinating stuff. Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming in as we've been going along. Um, so I'm going to do my best to read through them and try and amalgamate some that are quite similar. Um, and apologies in advance if we don't make it round to your question, but we'll do our best. Um, right, so there's some at the top that people have upvoted, so let's have a look what we've got. Um, so Fraser has asked, with the potential for the reintroduction of the Eurasian lynx around the corner, would this have a knock-on effect to recovering beaver populations? Would, would lynx reintroduction affect beaver recovery? Um, I can't think of a direct way that it would. But that might just be because I'm tired. Um, I'm going right. to say, I'm say no to that first. <laughs> Lynx are generally woodland creatures, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, beavers will help with the, the general productivity of the landscape. And so what I was saying there about kind of meso predators that might um, be hunting on riverbanks. Um, they might be more robust in population terms and um, that might feed on to, I mean, not that lynx are likely to be taking that, but th there might be some enrichment of the general system that, uh, that lynx could benefit from. And these are, again, species that have coexisted in other parts of the world and, and yeah. even in the UK for a very long time as well. Yeah. Okay, so Alan has asked, how likely is it that beavers can spread from Napdale and Tayside to other parts of the highlands, given the geographical constraints? Um, <clears throat> Napdale was actually chosen because of its isolation and its natural, kind of, that, was, that wasn't really the only reason, but that was deemed as attractive at the time of, in looking at um, the UK's first major reintroduction of a land mammal. Um, 
So I think that is unlikely uh, to happen quickly. The Tayside population of course, is already in the fourth, um, and there are so there are it is spreading, it is spreading out. That has quite a challenge on its hands to head uh, to the north many times the Cairngorms in the way, but they're not that far from the Spey and the Cairngorms National Park are um, doing some kind of thinking aloud in terms of well, what if they got here? How would we how would we react to that? So I think that I think that Tayside population is is spreading already, and uh, and will continue to do so in some directions. That link quite Sorry. slow. Quite slow. So that links with the question from Colin. He said, given no restrictions or intervention, any idea how long before they expand and occupy all the suitable territories in Scotland from the current, current strongholds? Um, it's kind of a difficult question to answer, isn't it? Because there are restrictions and there are interventions. Yeah, I think without translocation, uh, without that being restricted entirely on natural expansion, uh, I. Hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years. <laughs> it's really hard to know, Cap. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Elsa has asked: Will the trapped sediment and fertilizer filtered by the dam have any consequences on the dam itself, especially the fertilizer slash pesticides? Will things accumulate in the sediment? Um. Yes, uh, that will tend to happen. I mean, sediment will tend to be held at the base of the dam uh, there and maybe to an extent buried over time. Um, big flood events would uh, would wash that out, wash that down the system. Uh, so there, there, there could be some buildup release, but you know that might well in a flood event that might well end up at sea, which is where it all tends to end eventually anyway. <clears throat> So I think in general, um, yeah, the, it'll reduce, the, and some of it will be taken out of the system or be less accessible to that kind of event. So I don't think they would fertilize the dam and, uh, and lead to um, like, like a poison dam or anything like that. I think they would tend to, and of course they're, they're breaking down over time as well. Um, I'm sure there will be studies on that in terms of what, how, um, those kind of compounds behave in the in the aquatic environment over time in the sediment environment. But I'm not I'm not familiar with the detail, I'm afraid. Interesting stuff. There's a lot of different elements feeding in, aren't there? Lots of things to think about. Mm. Katrina has asked, would interbreeding of the Canadian and Eurasian beavers combat the problem of reduced genetic variety in the Eurasian beaver? Uh, uh, that's one of the arguments for it. So yeah. Well the argument is that it would help. Okay, and the next one from Andrew. What are the strategies for winning over land managers in introducing beavers to provide natural flood management? You kind of covered that in your talk, I think. Yeah, but I think there's also, there's also something you said about looking for ways to, well, to work with land managers in, in, in the policy area. Uh, and with farmers in particular, and the you know all the economic uncertainty they're faced with, are there benefits to begin from uh, explicitly? Well, from them, would they see benefits in public support for management that would support beavers, like the riparian uh, buffer strips I was talking about? Um, uh, so I think I think that's I think that would there. Are, it's, it's looking at that sort of change. What kind of public support um, is appropriate for that? Uh, I, I think it is, um, not just from, from a beaver point of view, but from a, a general environmental point of view, a range of reasons. And I think that I, I would like to think that we, there could be some common cause there. Finding that common cause can, can be difficult between conservation and farming because um, trust is short, but um, if, there, if there was a a corner to get into and fight from for that with farmers, then uh, I'd love to get into it. I watched a great documentary the, day, the other day, which may actually have been about the project in Bavaria or a project in Bavaria, where if farmers had an issue or any landowner had an issue, there was a voluntary service they could call up and someone would give them advice straight away or come out to their land and assess the situation straight mm. away. 
and there was this almost army of volunteers who were helping out with that. Do you know if, if anything similar exists? Is it is it reliant on charities? Um, here? Yeah, who do people call if they have an issue here? They call Nature Scott, um, who have, uh, I understand, a small number of staff uh, who can go out and visit, or they will send Roisin Campbell Palmer uh, to look at things as well. But it's yeah, it's it's quite a small resource. And I think one of the big one of the issues we have is that there isn't enough resource in beaver management on Tayside in Scotland. That is, and that's adding to the uh, the difficulties there. Okay, so Alistair has asked, are there any plans for beavers to be released in the Yorkshire Dales? And then Paul has responded saying there's a trial in North Yorkshire in crops and forests. I don't know if you know much about what's going on in Yorkshire, Alan. I, I don't know a lot. That slide of the um, beaver being released that was from Cropped and Forest. Rasheen was from, they, that was 2019, and it sounds like so far so good with that one. And um, they've got good habitat and a, and a suitable place. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed for that. Mm -hmm. We had a question from Matilda when you had the map up with the distribution across Europe and she'd noticed that there weren't many in Italy and she was wondering if there's any control in place in Italy that means that that's the case. Um, although Anne did suggest that it might be the big mountains on the Italian border that were preventing their movement. Yeah, <clears throat> the Alps and the, and the Jura. Um, I don't know, I don't know about Italian beavers I'm afraid. Um, Robert has asked if there will be any references available. Um, maybe you've got some links, Alan, that you could send to me that I could email out. Mm -hmm. He's studying environmental geography. I thought there's been some really good content to revisit. Okay. Oh, I've lost my place in the questions. I'll plug Rasheen's um, Beaver Management Handbook, which also includes contributions from Duncan Halley and other stars in the beaver conservation constellation, Derek Guy and others. Interesting question from Ellen here, um, who is talking about um, ecological issues associated with farmland um, and how farmland can potentially be not so great from a wildlife point of view. And she's asked how Trees for Life feel about that. The, yeah, I mean, an interesting one, we, 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 Trees for Life is Highland based um, and so it doesn't engage with, uh, with, that, with arable farming much. Um, but what I would say is, is come back to the fact that um, we need farming and farming is part, part of the solution for the challenges we face. Um, just on climate change, it's, it's a major part of how we talk about the, Scotland's land use response to climate change and the gains that are to be made from that and that's about forestry and farming. Uh, and there's so much change in the air. It's can the can the policy environment and can the can the support payments. We, you know, one of the benefits of Brexit is that we should have more uh, freedom to develop our own agricultural support policy. If that can be properly tailored, so we can have these win-wins where we can have food that we can produce without having to ship it across the world, uh, or we can uh, have farming that supports wildlife and sequesters carbon then um, if we can find that sweet spot, then we'll start to see things like this unlock and we'll start to look less, you, I think we might start to see less reluctance from, uh, from government to invest in, in these kinds of what are called nature-based solutions. And uh, the beaver is perhaps the epitome of, of a nature-based solution. Question from Tom here, what have been historically um, and now the predators of beavers? So what have been the so what are the predators of beavers historically and today? Yeah, that's that's an interesting one because um, beavers are quite hard to predate. Uh, they're so aquatic um, and they are you know, most active dawn and dusk. Um, and they're quite big. Um, so they're not that easy to get at as adults. Um, kits are no doubt taken by otters uh, and mink. That must happen, and uh, I would have thought opportunistic birds. Maybe a, a sea eagle might have a go at a, a beaver kit if they ever cross paths. Um, 
but I think the main, I think the biggest predator of beavers will be beavers in, in territorial competition. I'm aware that we're coming up to quarter past eight. Are you are you all right to answer a few more questions, Alan? I know you've got some. Yeah, more. just seeing somebody, Ursula's put in a interesting thing about um, uh, chromosome compatibility between castor fiber, the Eurasian beaver, and the, and the North American beaver. So that's field crossbreeding attempts. So that's interesting. I'll have a look at that, Ursula, because um, I had read otherwise. So, really interesting. Yes, happy to answer a few more. Okay. Um, Nicole has asked, is there potential for conflicts between otters and beavers? I mean, there's potential, but I don't think it's, it's likely to be significant. Uh, you know, they obviously interact a lot on the river. Um, they're not competing for prey. They're not competing for anything, really. Um, if, uh, you know, an otter might learn that uh, they could find they could find their way into uh, or, or, or get their jaws into uh, into kits. Uh, there's a there's a possible conflict. I thought that would be quite rare as well. Willowgate Activity Centre have said the beavers near Perth don't build dams, or they've never seen any. Although Rona has said that they have seen some dams, um, they wondered if it may be because uh, the river is quite wide with a strong flow and it's tidal, and they're wondering what environmental benefits beavers might have in that environment. In a coastal environment. It, yeah, and there's, yeah, so they're, I guess we think we're in a, in a classic place, but they, they will have the same, you know, they'll be affecting the land in the same way, uh, perhaps in a reduced way, so I think probably less, um, less significant than uh, inland. Um, but they will be, they'll be introducing structure to the river and that will create more opportunities and they'll be, they'll be affecting bank vegetation. So all that should diversify the landscape uh, physically uh, and, uh, and create more feeding opportunities. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, as well, for that comment about the, uh, the wolves. Uh, Larissa has asked, um, does or did the collection of castoreum have an influence on population numbers? Hmm. You need to kill a beaver to get its castoreum. They are tucked well inside, well inside it, shall we put it um, delicately. So that, that um, you see it a lot, there are these kind of medieval drawings of uh, a beaver giving up its, uh, what looks like its, its testicles are actually, I think, a, a medieval misunderstanding of uh, beaver anatomy. Uh, the castorium gland is is up inside its bum. Okay, a uh, comment from Rachel here. Salmon and sea trout can scale or navigate small cascades. What evidence is there to suggest beaver dams, beaver dams are a hindrance to fish populations? So you mentioned they're a hindrance in low flow. Yes, yeah, so there are studies that show that um, if, there, if there's not enough water for the uh, for salmon, say, to get a to get a jump run and jump up the dam then it can struggle to get up there it might struggle to get around and through it so it can it can and has happened um but it uh, how often it happens that's the that's the subject of dispute or how often it might happen i think is, is the subject of dispute but i think i think most people accept that uh you know it's 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 a pretty minor thing otherwise we wouldn't have had salmon and beaver and sea trout living together uh you know, throughout time. Um, somebody else asked if beaver deceivers could help fish to navigate beaver dams. Uh, no, because the, um, the, the the outlet, the, be the beaver is faced with the, the downstream, oh, sorry, the fish is faced with the downstream side of the, of the dam and the pipe will be at, towards the top of the dam. So it's to, be, it's to get from downstream to upstream that's the problem. As the uh, it's the, the downstream end is high, so the, the fish would have to be kind of looking to be as well jump on the dam anyway. 
gosh, we've still got lots and lots of questions. I'm still going for the ones that have got more votes near the top at the moment. Um, how can the beaver po positively affect the dipper? Are there any studies about it? Uh, not that I'm aware of, uh, but I, you know, dippers are looking for clean water and they're looking for um, prey in that water. And beavers are known to uh, increase water cleanliness and uh, an invertebrate prey. So they should be, they should benefit. A uh, question from Hannah about the beavers in Tayside. We've touched on this already. Um, she has said that the beavers in Tayside are causing many problems and issues for farmers and landowners, but they bring many benefits. Due to the beavers being protected, making it illegal to cull and hard to manage numbers on land, are there any schemes or programs in place for farmers and landowners to use or access to help with damage costs, etc., from having beavers present on their land? Hmm. There's nothing for costs. Uh, there is a uh, farmer has beavers on their ground in Tayside. They can they contact Nature Scott and they operate a licensing system. And um, we are we are currently in dispute with Nature Scott about how that operates. Um, but what they they will issue licenses and those licenses the law requires if you're going to um, intervene in a beaver dam. Then you, you need a license for that from Nature Scott. So they, they will they will they'll look at where the, where the farm is, they'll do a certain amount of investigation. That's that's part of our dispute with them, what that investigation is. And then they may issue that license. They also issue licenses for lethal control. So um, beavers on in the prime agricultural land on Tayside uh, can be culled. And in, let me get this right, 2019, 87 beavers were killed. So that was a fifth of the known population at the time. <clears throat> and that has triggered, well, a, a lot of controversy, in, including the action we're taking with Nature Scott. Uh, so there's another question from Stephen on that. So there's nothing, no subsidies for lost income as a result of beavers currently. Correct. Uh, Daniela said otters do predate kits. Um, she has seen adult beavers chasing the otters off quite frequently. No, where's that? She hasn't said. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay, a question from Larissa, which looks quite scientific. With beaver dams raising the water level, enabling the dissolution of the organic carbon from the soil releasing to the atmosphere, what's your take on that potentially being a driver of climate change? Beavers raise water level and that increases dissolved organic carbon. Enabling the dissolution of organic carbon from the soil. Okay. That. Presumably that would be happening anyway with runoff and things like that. Would it be happening more with the, with the beaver dams raising the water level, do you think? I'm not sure that it would. I, I wouldn't think so. Would, yeah, but maybe something we'd have to um, talk about um, verbally if you like to. Just to, just to understand where that question is coming from. Uh, it might depend a bit on soil type and geology. Uh, if carbon carbonaceous rocks are releasing and soils are releasing carbon that way through water level. But uh, I mean, if you think about uh, just thinking about waterlogged soils, they tend to be tend to be anaerobic, tend to uh, lock up carbon. So yeah, I think I just need to understand where the, where the, dissolved, where the source of dissolved organic carbon is. I think it's, I think there are other factors in play as well when you consider the fact that there's gonna be, you know, coppiced trees and more greenery and things appearing in potential buffer zones. That's, you know, if, if there is any effect from more dissolved, um, dissolved organic carbon, then that would potentially be offset by the changes in habitat around the river anyway. It's quite complex, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. The, I mean, we have we could have a conversation about what the potential mechanism is for releasing that dissolved carbon, uh, and where it'll be from, and how that would be affected by other changes that that might result in the river system, as you say, can. Um. So you've mentioned that people need a license if they want to interfere with with beaver dams in any way. Um. So we know that beavers are protected by law. What exactly does that protection mean? What What is that protection in law? 
Oh uh, no, sorry, sorry, I've misunderstood the question. I just misread the question. Is there any protection for beavers in uh, in England? So they're protected in Scotland, aren't they? I'm not completely sure about this, but I think the answer to that is no. I I have a feeling it's currently under review at the moment, and the government is yet to make a decision. Yeah. So uh, beavers are. I think I'm right in saying in, in England are entirely official populations are entirely behind or kept in enclosures and therefore aren't aren't yet to, uh, termed a native species and therefore won't enjoy any protection. Um, there were a couple of questions about about trapping and translocations and um, someone asked how do you identify the problem beaver or when you when you move a beaver is it do, are you moving the whole family or are you just moving some individuals are they translocated together i mean almost always your preference is to, is to is to catch the whole family if you've got if you've ideally you've, you know you really know you know the family you know the beavers that are causing the the issues and uh you i mean i, I would defer to the likes of roisin here and her expertise people like that and you know the, the people at royal geological society are experiencing this as well Potentially, you could uh, uh, identify a maturing subadult, and um, if you trap that and it was, you know, getting close to dispersing age anyway, you might feel comfortable about moving that. But it's that would be a case by case call. But yeah, I almost always you, you want to catch that whole family because it is a unit, um, and they are dependent on each other. You know, this time of year, <clears throat> the bodies in the lodge literally it's just the number of bodies that are uh, keeping each other warm, especially for the especially for the young. Um, Colin has asked, any progress for more releases in Scotland? National parks are a great example of where they should be released without much of a debate. Uh, no. And that, uh, so that, and that's <clears throat> part of the issue. So the, you know, pro beaver organisations and interests like ours think that that should be an active part of how we, we manage the, the, the problem on Tay side, but also how we think about the genetic challenges and um, and, uh, and and use the benefits of beavers as a nature-based solution with all the caveats about the the importance of having all that properly discussed thoroughly discussed in advance with people in a catchment and planning for how you're going to deal with the changes that beavers will bring so that touches on the next question from ben has the tayside beaver release set back wider introductions by being done without engagement and replicating the conflict of bavaria in the 90s or has it forced an issue <laughs> well, Ben, you could go all over that one. I, I mean, it's it is certain, it's definitely a massive part of the situation that um, you know people affected by beavers feel this has been done to us, and um, that is unfair. And I agree with that. So um, the. <laughs> So yes, from that point of view, equally the there's there's this issue that it's it's a it's a factor that the, the frustration that affects people, and, and and I understand that as well. But I think that um, in looking to in looking to bring an agenda forward, I think that I think that damages the long term interests, and I think we're we're paying that we're paying for that long term damage right now. Does that, I hope that answers Ben's question, but I, I think I put myself in there. <clears throat> it's it's it elongated the problem rather than shortened it. Okay, we still have 32 questions and we're almost at plus eight. How are you doing, Alan? Uh, I'm all right for a while anyway, if, uh, if everybody else hasn't fallen off. Well, we've lost a few people, but um, yeah, they obviously weren't waiting for an answer. Um, James has asked, is, is there any collaboration between beaver reintroduction programmes and Scottish forestry as a whole? Beaver reintroduction programmes? Reintroduction programmes. Um, no. I'll say a diplomatic no to that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think officially Scottish forestry is neutral on it. Question 
From Leslie, do you think there's any chance of government funding management, given that they're likely to save money if flooding is reduced? I would like to think so. I would like to think that um, the, the rhetoric from government about um, nature-based solutions means that they consider investing in, in beavers of that and, and investing in making beavers work and, and, and addressing these issues, these practical and, and human issues. Um, and yeah, we'll see, we might see a bit more what happens on the other side of the election, on the other side of May. There's an opportunity for change there. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a sense that I, you know, that the climate emergency and the the nature crisis that the first minister herself has highlighted um, are 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 a much higher profile issues than the, than they were even five years ago. So, and um, there's more scope than there has ever been. Let's put it that way. Okay, and question from Christopher. When can we expect to see beavers in the Trees for Life rewilding areas? <laughs> um, that is, that's entirely out with our hands and very much in the hands of government. So uh, I have no idea, Christopher, sorry. <laughs> I'd love to answer that. Um, Fiona's asked, how many beavers are there in the Bewley area? Are there still beavers in the Bewley area? <laughs> um, there might be. Um, they were, the beavers that we found there in 2017 uh, were trapped. Um, we, uh, we think there may have been a couple left. They may, may have still, they may still be there. Um, and they may or may not have had babies, but they, certainly the government's instruction to um, SNH as it was then was to was to go back and get them. Whether they have succeeded in that, I don't know. Catherine has asked, are there any suggestions for information regarding similarities and differences between the approaches to beaver management with the North American and Eurasian beavers? I guess, um, again, when we send out some references, we could send out a list of, of good sources of information. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, Catherine, that's what kind of grabbed my attention about, about those two Lassie episodes, because I think that, you know, they both refer to, they both refer to the US authorities. One that's, you know, the central character is from the, the Forest Service as it was in the 60s, and uh, another one that the beavers that they eventually trap um, after Lassie lets them go at first. Um, but they lose their trap at the end of the episode. Go off to the off to the wildlife service. So they've had and, and the you know you look back at like that poster I showed shows that there there was a and, and, and I think an area still is a conflict between beaver conservation and farming. So there, there's there absolutely will be experience from there of, uh, of those conflicts and uh, resolving with differing degrees of success as well. I think so, um, not everyone has uh, ended in peace as yet. Michelle has asked, how far can beavers travel? She says, you may laugh, a couple of years ago, we saw what we thought was a beaver crossing the road at dawn in Turriff, Aberdeenshire. If not a beaver, do you know what else it could have been? Uh, so that's unlikely to have traveled there itself. Full stop. Um, what else could it have been? A fat spaniel. <laughs> Um, if it's dawn, different light, could you cut an otter that way? Certainly, I mean, they're, they're really hard. They can sometimes be a mistake in swimming, but uh, crossing a road, I think that'll be a difficult mistake to make. Uh, so, yeah, I think you've got yourself a conspiracy theory there. Excellent. Love a good conspiracy theory. <laughs> um, interesting question from Sean here. Has there been any work looking at the effect of dams on stream temperatures? There's a push for riparian tree planting to provide shade, which would mitigate climate warming. How would beavers be compatible with this? Uh, very, and that's that's one of the arguments that um, can be made in, in favour of beavers is that shading that they um, in encompassing you know, willow, a classic uh, riverbank species, 
uh, and other trees, then that can actually increase shading and increase the variety as well. So you get you get some shaded areas, but there are other areas where they've just felled trees and, uh, and they'll be a little warmer. So that kind of variation, that diversity of habitat, in-stream habitat uh, is something that beavers keep, they keep changing, it keeps it dynamic uh, and tends to be positive. Fishery science is, is sophisticated and I'm sure there have been studies on water temperature behind dams and in pools. Um, I, I never have thought that, you know, in, in, a, in a dammed body of water in a river that the depth of that would perhaps be cooler than it might otherwise be. Um, and certainly, certainly pools that are cut off, you know, be in that kind of beavery wetland, um, there'll also be a, a kind of redoubt for um, for fish in times of low water, uh, and will will help help them with their temperature regulation at times compared to you know if you're looking at, at a drought a droughty time in a warm period, then um, those pools will also help fish survival. Question is coming from Sarah. Does beaver activity affect riverbanks overwhelmed by Himalayan balsam? No idea, Sarah. Um, no idea. Is it, Alan? Sorry? I think they would eat it. No. But that's because I hate it. So <laughs> spent too long pulling it in the past life. Um, I would. It, they might. Um, I doubt they would graze on it in a big way compared to what they're used to. And I think the disturbance that they create if they went in, they they might exacerbate spread slightly. What they will do though is in uh, you know as they kind of in their grazing and their perhaps if they're uh, again if they're coppicing or um, or foraging an area and, and chewing aquatic vegetation that might help actually help keep the parts of the riverbank uh, more densely vegetated and reduce the opportunities for uh, impatiens and Himalayan balsam to colonize. Michael has asked, are there any more plans for urban beaver release like the Plymouth Project? That's quite a new one, isn't it? And I heard of the Plymouth Project. Um, I'm actually in Plymouth, I should know about this. Yeah, <laughs> you chance with that one, Kat. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't know, an urban release, that sounds amazing. My understanding was it was on the outskirts of the city rather than, than fully urban, um, but I would need to look into it a little bit mm. more. I haven't heard of any urban programmes myself. Yeah, I mean, I've seen beavers in cities in, like in Riga, beavers running around absolute city centre, not running around, I've seen, I've seen their chew and a lodge. Um, so they're, yeah, they can, they, they are um, a, a regular presence in a lot of European cities. I guess it would depend on food supply and habitat, wouldn't it? If they've got that, then... Yeah, I mean, are we, are we strip sometimes in kind of park areas and sometimes just you know these kind of canalized big wide river something of this river in Riga um and I kind of had a muddy sort of flat bit that was kind of colonized by willow scrub and then you can see where they had to protect kind of parkland trees with uh, with wire guards and you could see where you know these kind of big trees the beaver had climbed up across the riverbank and waddled over to a tree and taken a lump out of it and uh, and they come back with a, a tree guard to keep it off so yeah, somebody's hunting there in the middle of Munich. Beavers eat young Japan. Andrew knows all this stuff. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Good to see you here, Andrew. So if, in case anyone missed that, we were just looking at the comment from Andrew saying that beavers eat young Japanese knotweed, but no sign on the river urn that they eat Himalayan balsam, which is rampant. Thing. Both um, Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed are invasive species in the UK. Um, questions are still coming in. So, generally, how quickly do you see the positive impacts of the landscape and increasing biodiversity after after beavers move to an area? Oh, um, that's an interesting one. So the the Bavarian experience is as good a way of perhaps a window into this as any. Released in the 60s, uh, I'm afraid I don't have the precise details of years, but <clears throat> for about 20 years, everybody was like, oh, this is good. There are beavers around and we like that. 
And then by the 80s, though, that the population had built and it was going through that stage of that as uh, young were starting to disperse into more and more marginal habitat. And it's a classic kind of population. As the population builds, the range expands, and the young beavers are looking for uh, places to go. And a lot of the good habitat is already occupied by, um, by families. And so they're being pushed on all the time. So they're pushing into more marginal areas. And that's when they start to become more visible and, uh, and more prominent and where their, um, their impacts are felt on any sensitive land uses to a greater extent. So um, I'm kind of asking this, I'm kind of answering this from, I guess, a human point of view, but, and then what you find is after that, that the population sort of settles down again and comes into balance with its available territories that are there. So I guess that's, that's actually not the answer to the question. That's kind of how people will, that's how people will perceive it in the pattern in which people will read it. I think though, if you've got, it'll depend on the landscape and if beavers are prone to dam, then I think you will see that quite quickly. And I think you will see biodiv the biodiversity benefits uh, accrue quickly. I think if, uh, if they're not damming, but just kind of foraging around, then it'll be, it'll be a slower burn. Uh, so they'll be, they'll be foraging on the banks. They'll be doing a bit of burrowing. Um, they might do some, maybe some minor damming in inside tributaries. Because that if there's if there's something they want to get at, but I think there it's a it's a it's a slower slower build up and, and the impacts will be will be a bit smaller in biodiversity terms. Thanks, Alan. Um, just in case anyone hasn't seen in the chat, um, Michael sent us a link to a press release about the beaver release in Plymouth. So I've just reposted that that link so that everybody can see it in the chat. We've had a good question from Leanne. Um, he says, how do you manage a beaver's food availability? Do they not eventually run out in one area? Yeah, they do it. So they will, um, and this kind of relates to territory size, they will look to um, work through an area and then move on. So part of the, part of the reason the beaver's a challenge is that it's mobile and, uh, and continues to, to work through the landscapes. They'll move on to, to other territories. Uh, and start there or within a territory and there. So the competition, it's, it's a, it can be a, a kind of a, a, a dynamic that, that keeps developing over time. Okay, um, we're getting there now. Have you got five more minutes, Alan? Yeah. Okay, I think we might be able to do it. So Stephen has asked, um, are excessive nutrients trapped by the dam from slurry runoff beneficial or do the nutrients just cause too much algae? It doesn't seem like a natural process. Yeah, it's it's not natural to have um, <clears throat> you know major nutrient runoff in a in a river system, uh, but beaver dams will tend to <clears throat> tend to store it and kind of and uh, take it out of the environment uh, at least temporarily. But they're also the the buildup will be mitigated by the fact that dams are leaky to an extent, so some will leak downstream. But it's, based, it's slowing the input into the system, I think is, is the main effect they'll have. And so where you've got, so in, um, uh, yeah, in areas where, in the, there, I mentioned some places where beavers have been reintroduced to, to help take nutrient uh, and fertilizer runoff out of water supply and out of sediment. That's the, the thinking behind that. <clears throat> How quickly it's released and, uh, and whether you have you know, these kind of big kind of sudden explosions, if, if there's a store in it, uh, and it bursts, uh, that'll depend on, on the river catchment itself and how prone that is to, to flooding or, or big kind of catastrophic high flow events. Another one from Stephen. Is there a halfway house for beavers to go to when they're trapped before re relocating them? Um, or is there a constant supply of places for those beavers to move to? So do they stop somewhere in between? Yeah, I think uh, most of the beavers that have gone to England in the last couple of years, I understand, have gone to a, a holding facility that's well set up to hold them. They get health checked there, uh, they get disease screened, um, and they uh, and, the, and then they're kind of when the release site's ready, then then they're moved on. So there are good handling facilities available, um, and it's it's just making sure that there needs to be, I think, a bit of planning so that uh, the number of beavers being trapped 
release uh, doesn't exceed the capacity of that of that holding center before they before they move on. A question from Beth: Can beavers still evolve the landscape when no trees are present in their immediate area? Uh, yes, apparently they can. They're not. They apparently under climate change are expanding more into tundra areas, and so studies have been done in terms of what they what they will do there. Um, how they build lodges, uh, how they access food, but they'll, they'll be foraging there, they'll be affecting that vegetation. Uh, they may well be altering hydrology to get at that vegetation. So uh, you'll see a, a kind of a more open ground or a, or a kind of treeless variant on, on the beaver landscape, the beaver wetland landscape. That's fascinating. Uh, Peter has asked, have zoos provided any genetic diversity? I don't think so. I think all of the, um, certainly in Scotland, um, all of the, uh, well, all the nap deal beavers were caught from wild populations. Uh, Bavarians have exported a lot of beavers. Um, under the, the, there's the kind of, they've got their own uh, beaver hero there, a guy called Gerhard Schwab, who's, uh, who's famous in beaver circles for pioneering that. Um, the better answer to Bavaria's problems. And so he he has done all he can and continues to do all he can to exhaust the opportunities to translocate problem Bavarian beavers, and they're all coming from the wild. I don't um I don't think any come from collections as such. The Royal Zoological Society of Scotland are have been a key player in terms of understanding that then if it's with the genetic specialists and the veterinary specialists, um that's where that expertise primarily sits in Scotland. And so that's been there, they've made a major contribution, uh, particularly from those angles. Um, another one from Stephen, this is a really good one. Does the Bavarian riparian approach extend to drainage ditches? Hmm. I don't know, Stephen. I think that uh, where they have, um, I think where they have the banks, I think that reduces the extent to which they will go up the um, up the ditches anyway. I imagine some ditches have been uh, treated in that way, but uh, I am not familiar enough with Bavaria to know exactly whether whether they've gone that far. Okay, we're at, we're at eight forty six, so I might just do one more and then we'll call it a night so that you can get back to your family. <laughs> Um, these have been fascinating questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, sorry if we didn't get around questions. your questions, but just one more from Claire. Can you summarise the reasons for the differences in beaver spreading rate on the east, Tayside, versus west, Napdale in Scotland? I think it's a, well, probably a range of factors, so no, I can't summarise it. Um, but my, um, what I would say is that the factors I would look at are the, the topography is so different. The habitat is so different. Uh, the size of the finding populations were so different. Uh, so larger, larger numbers of beavers um, were, were fed into Tayside and went to Napdale. Uh, the Napdale beavers and the Napdale area isn't that doesn't have uh, great natural connections, hydrological connections to other parts of Scotland. So uh, it's a smaller catchment. Tayside's the biggest catchment. Uh, in Scotland, and has lower as um, it's kind of it's a connection to the fourth. For instance, some of those are uh, fairly short distances for beavers to travel, on, and they clearly have travelled and uh, made their way, you know, making their way towards the Clyde now as well. I understand, so it's better network there. There are areas of more productive habitats, so um, that in that period um, before people really started to notice the presence of beavers on Tayside. <clears throat> that would have the finding population would have been able to build more, produce more sub adults to go uh, prospecting for territories. So it, it built up a bigger base. So there was uh, more beavers to go at who had access to more food and uh, a, a, a greater physical connected network to the rest of the country. Uh, and, and that all of those are significantly different to not deal. Uh, so that was a summary answer, actually. <laughs> I'll go with that. 
Brilliant. Thanks for that. Thank you so much, Alan, for um, for sticking around and answering all those questions. We've got loads of really appreciative comments coming in. Um, I think we will leave it there because we've overrun by quite a lot. Um, but yeah, huge thank you. You definitely earned your paycheck tonight, as if you hadn't already. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the beer anyway. Thanks for all the questions, guys. That was uh, very great to have so much active interest and, and comments coming through. So um, yeah, thanks yeah, very much for that. And thanks to everyone who's contributed little bits of information and links and things as yeah. well. Yeah, loads of that. Can you, can you, <laughs> can we leave a record of all this chat, Kath? Yeah, the chat saved automatically, so I've got all the links. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because there's some really good input there. Yeah, really fascinating stuff. Thanks again, everyone. Um, if you do have 30 seconds more, it would be great if you could just stick in the chat any other topics that you're interested in hearing about from us, because we will be doing some more webinars. Um, and as I say, keep an eye on our Facebook page, Eventbrite, um, if you're wanting to hear about um, the details of them. Otherwise, we'll say good night and thanks again, and hopefully see you next time. Yeah. Cheers, all.